there's a problem right now with people over identifying with their trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think because lots of people, you know, we have access to therapy. That's really changed the game for how we grow. It's like we aren't in nature as much. Mm-hmm. We don't, and that's by means of lifestyle. And we don't go into nature to heal. Like mm-hmm. you couldn't dial up a therapist even really 20 years ago. <laughs> like you had to make an appointment, you know, all this. And now you can, it's all on Zoom. And so I think because, um, just the the accessibility of it, we train the mind less. Mm-hmm. We're becoming dependent on therapy. And the ego will want you to identify as your trauma as long as possible. It will want you to stay in the soup. It's actually the ego mind that is creating the depression. Mm-hmm. It's inescapable for lots of us. I think the ego is... Like, this is so important to say. It's like, I am for loving the ego. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to say. (laughs) The ego is how it's one of the greatest gifts. The shadow is how you find your light. Yes. The, The ego that is all this masking is how you realize who you really are. We're here to talk about something that feels very alive right now in this moment. So So, what y'all just heard was a short clip of a longer episode that we did with Danielle Laporte, which was, I mean, season three has been short, but in my opinion so far, like my most exciting conversation, I just, I look up to her. I think she brought up so many good points. Mm -hmm. I think she's not afraid to talk about things that make people uncomfortable. Um, She never really has been. And That very small clip of a larger conversation, which I think is important for people to have me reiterate, has gotten a lot of response. Um, Actually, what I would say both both negative and positive, I don't know if I would even say negative, but but both pushback and also acceptance, meaning on my personal page sharing that clip, it's been reshared by others onto their stories more than any other cheaper than therapy clip that I've ever posted. And it's also gotten the most pushback in the comments on both, both my page, the cheaper than therapy page. I'm not sure about your personal one today. So I just think it's, (laughs) nobody comes for you. People, everybody comes for me. (laughs) We'll direct our issues. I just think it's funny the way people come for you. Not for me, I'm like, why are you coming for Vanessa? Because I'll take my earrings off. Like, maybe it's, maybe it's my energy. I mean, I kind of have an energy that my earrings are always off. So I'm kind of surprised. I mean, literally, like, I'd probably be the one who's like, how are you doing? And you'd be like, this. Well, that's what's so funny about it, right? Because even in one of the comment responses, the first one that we got where you were like, you know, should I respond to this person? I gave you like a super cut and dry black and white. And then when I saw how you responded, it was like, with so much love, love and you. with so much respect. And like, I totally see you. And I was like, that is so not how I wrote it. <laughs> you changed like, every yeah, word of what I wrote. <laughs> this a little bit because I don't really feel like that's what I would say. <laughs> every word of what I wrote was changed. <laughs> um, but yes, I don't know what that is. Cause even in my responses on my own personal page, I'm just very cut and dry about it. You know, mm-hmm. anyway, um, <laughs> let's talk about some of the pushback, shall we? Sure. So one of the things that she says in this clip, there's two, there's two different, mm-hmm. I guess, takeaways or thoughts that were kind of encapsulated in this one clip and people in my, on my page are having a response to both, right? Mm -hmm. Either simultaneously or separately. So the first one she says is that we kind of, as a society, um, are becoming over identified with our trauma. Mm -hmm. And even in the audio of this clip, you hear me say, I agree with that, but I'm thinking, I'm, I I guess I'm wondering today, kind of what is your thought on that idea? Like, let's take it deeper into kind of like what your idea, my idea is around that idea, but also your thoughts around what the pushbacks or pushback is. Sure. So there's a larger conversation and point that I feel like Danielle was making that I think both of us are in agreement with. Um, What she was talking about was, from my perspective, ego identifications and 
um, she was having a larger spiritual conversation, right? And what I hear underneath that statement of we have come to a place of over-identifying with our trauma is really that we have come to a place of over-identifying with form, Mm. with we are these bodies, we are these experiences that we have while we are in this human form and sort of not being willing to do the oftentimes really difficult work of attempting to integrate the experiences of our life and make meaning. And what I thought was really interesting about that clip is some of the most positive responses, the people who commented with like a, yes, thank you for saying this. Absolutely. Are people oftentimes that I know personally have been through significant trauma right, and had to cultivate tools of working through it and really come to an understanding that they are not their trauma, that their trauma was put into their life experience for a reason for them to transmute and overcome. And that it is in really beautiful ways shaped who they are. But, you know, similar to the conversation that you and I often have about spiritual bypassing and people really pushing back on toxic positivity, I think the struggle I've had a lot of times with the arguments around those things is that it almost sort of minimizes the spiritual tools that people who actually have had to find a way to make meaning of life's bigger challenges. It's not those those things aren't truths, um, you know, like that, like there is uh, a growth and like, you know, lessons and everything. All things are lessons that the universe God would have us learn. Um, yes, saying that to someone in the midst of a really difficult moment might feel like toxic positivity. It doesn't mean that that's not a larger truth, right? And I think sometimes the attempt to not allow um, the moment to be sort of over skirt skirted takes away from the ways that actually some of those principles have been really supportive of people who've had to work to overcome difficult moments. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> Something I said numerous times on my page, and I, I kind of want to say here again, is a yes and, because <laughs> the yes and that's coming up, the and for me is around things that happen to people like children, for example, right? So we're talking mm -hmm. sexual abuse. We're talking, um, you know, so this idea of things coming in into our life to teach us greater lessons, even I have a really hard time with putting that spiritual practice or lesson kind of on top of trauma like that. Um, as somebody who kind of comes from a line of people who have had sexual abuse as children um, and has seen, you know, the personal effects of what that does. Uh, I don't know if I love that term or that way of thinking to almost be in the same soup with that type of trauma. And what do you think about that? I mean, I think you and I have a little bit different perspectives on this. So here's what I will say about that. When I say the most significant traumas, those are the things that I'm speaking of. When I say people that I've been most inspired in my own journey have been people that have, have moved through those type of traumas. Um, two or three retreats ago, I had a woman who, dealt with that specific type of trauma in a way with so much grace, mm -hmm. such a master, so much work that she has done to make meaning, understanding of where that person was coming from, how they could wrap their mind around doing something like that to a child. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I listen, <laughs> please don't hear me as minimizing um, what it takes to get to that level of I will not allow that experience to define who I am. She's my freaking hero. Mm -hmm. And that is what she is. And she has done it. And if she can do it, what I'm saying is it's clear to me that it's possible to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying yeah. I did it, but I'm saying people do. Yeah. I mean, I also think there's, there's nuance that social media can't capture, right? You and I struggle mm -hmm. with this with social, just at a larger, larger kind of perspective. Um, especially social media and psychology, right? The inner intersection of those two worlds. I often talk a lot in my codependency work with people, obviously, who have had very traumatic upbringings, right? Because we know a lot of the parenting is kind of cause for or helps uh, aid and abet in the development of the codependent kind of personalities. And there have been many people where they've come to me and they've said, some variation of I'm trying to forgive. I'm trying to make meaning of, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to write all of these things and they're not there yet. And they feel bad about the fact 
that they're mm-hmm. not there yet, right? Mm-hmm. Like I do think there is this kind of messaging and I don't think this is what you're doing. I think this is more of that kind of like bypass that we're talking about. There is sometimes messaging out there that makes people believe that if they haven't moved into a place of forgiveness or meaning making, that there's something wrong with them, right? And many times when I'm talking to these people, I I will flat out and I have flat out just said, stay in the anger. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Like if that's where you're at right now, I, it is not my place to say to you that you should be on the other side of that in a place of meaning making. It is not my place mm-hmm. to say that you should have already moved through and integrated whatever that quote unquote lesson is or was, right? Um, if where you're at on your journey right now is a place of rage, then that actually might be part of your healing journey and it might be a place that you need to sit in for a little while. And I only say that to reiterate that, I mean, you're not, you're not disagreeing with that. I, I, I'm layering on the idea that each of the emotional, um, I don't know the word I'm thinking of, but like every step along the journey, right? Every one of these kind of emotional places that we go through on our journey towards integration, towards healing, towards even if you want to use the word forgiveness, um, is valuable and valued and needs to be revered and respected for what it is, right? Now, I have also in the same breath said to them, if we're talking 30 years down the road and you're still a place where you're, you're in so much rage that it's affecting your ability to show up, in your world, in your life, with your children, with your partner, whatever, then that's a different conversation, right? But if you feel like right now on the journey, this is the place that you're at, I I actually don't, I don't want to take that from you. Like that, that could be part of your healing. Part of your healing. Absolutely. But what I heard in the statement that Danielle was making when people over identify Mm -hmm. with their trauma, that to me speaks to the extent to which for many people, this becomes the defining factor of yes. my life. Yes. This becomes, I see myself as this traumatic event that I've experienced. And I do think that there's a way that that can define an entire lifetime for a Agreed. lot of people. Mm-hmm. And that does break my heart. And I'm, you know, I think a lot of times when, when people are in the response of the response of feeling like I'm being shamed for where I am, mm. it's, that's my own experience of feeling like I shouldn't feel the way that I feel, but let's be real. It doesn't feel good to be stuck in that space of identifying with my trauma for the majority of my life. That doesn't feel like, um, I'm thriving and enjoying this life it's experience. Not this isn't me saying exactly. This isn't me saying you should rush to be anywhere that you're not, but I do think there's suffering in that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you know, uh, we know, with everything, not just with this conversation, how common it is for us humans to to pendulum swing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I do feel like the landscape right now and the conversation around trauma, while there has been, I mean, amazing understanding, we've come leaps and bounds in trauma, how it impacts us, you know, the the impact on the body, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. I mean, there's so many different kind of factors. I think the pendulum has swung so far that this is what we're now seeing, right? Which is we are actually becoming identified with our trauma. It becomes an identifying characteristic of who I am and who you are. You know, we're, um, when you're listening to this, we're actually kind of about to leave this conversation and we're going to go into an interview with somebody. And I listened to a video of his last night where he said, if you're somebody who's, who's easily triggered or easily activated, maybe not listen to the rest of this video. But, and then he said, I do this exercise, I'm going to paraphrase, where I pretend that uh, the trauma, the main source of kind of pain in my life, like what if, let's just talk like matrix level, what if this reality is not real? And that trauma is not real. It didn't happen, right? Like it happened in another kind of dimension is like he was kind of kidding around about, but like giving you basically a different way to look at it, right? And Mm -hmm. actually right now it didn't exist. If you could look through that lens and then see how your relationships, you know, your life, your work, everything has been impacted by this belief that this trauma existed. And then if that trauma were, you know, we were to say poof, like it didn't actually exist. It's not real. How would you show up differently? How would you be different in your life? I thought that was such an amazing prompt because Mm -hmm. it gives the ego 
an opportunity to let go this identification, let go of, right? Put it down for a moment and say, how would I be different? How would I show up differently? What would my life look like if this thing or multiple things weren't true, right? And I, I thought that was a really good exercise that that fed into, I guess, this conversation. Yeah, it's such a larger esoteric conversation. Um, and I think that that is the, you know, I think I've heard depth psychologists speak to the fact that we as a collective have lost our connection to spirit. Mm -hmm. That is like the larger source of our suffering that we believe these structures, this time and this body is what we are. Um, and that was not always the case. And I think mm -hmm. this over identification with who I am in this body, the physical world, as I can see it, what I accumulate in terms of material goods is what defines me really creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of, um, internal, you know, like a lack of like trust and grounding in something larger. And, you know, it's so funny. I, um, am reading Neil Donald Walsh, I think is his name's books, um, conversations with God. And they're really, really beautiful. I just recently got introduced to his work by another podcast guest who's coming on in a couple weeks, Preston Smiles. But um, it's it's fascinating how I lead groups that sort of carried over from the, the Tat Lab. And this was the most challenging group that I've ever had. And it was basically, he was saying, nothing outside of love is real. Mm. Even fear is basically rooted in love because fear is love demonstrated in a particular way. If you loved nothing, you'd fear nothing. Right. And like just the simple concepts that everything is love really was like activating to the group understandably, because there are some things that every part of our ego wants to fight against believing is love. But he was saying, even terrorists, um, or, you know, like people that commit these horrific atrocities, there is some thing that they believe in, whether it is, I want to fight for a better life in my family, or this leader will give me liberation from something, um, something that they are either like afraid of happening or continuing to happen, that they're resisting based on something that they love or something that they desire. But no matter what, it's always rooted in some sort of love for something. And I think you know, we're just coming off of a, um, an election <laughs> earlier this week. And it's amazing to me how often in the stance of righteousness about what we believe is truth from our perspective, based on our experience of life, we will look at someone across the aisle who feels differently than we do. And we will meet them with something that is very much not seeming like love right? Like with a lot of hate, frankly, fear. And we will, we will do it based on what we love, what we think is the right life that we want for our children, the um, world around us as we feel that it should be. But it's always based on love underneath it. And, you know, it was interesting. It was one of the, as we were talking through it, just watching the group have more resistance <laughs> to what I was saying than ever before. And I understand it. But we really, really, um, the ego will fight to defend its its stance that it it knows what is truth and that there are some people that are bad and I am not one of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that if you're grappling with that concept, because as I was when I first when I when you first said it, <clears throat> I guess one could even say like even the love of preserving the self, even the love of. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure how to articulate this, but again, the kind of the example that's coming up for me is like child abuse, right? Um, especially mm -hmm. something like the nature of like sexual molestation or child abuse. And in my head, I'm going, how does that ladder up to love? How does that behavior happen from love? And the only way that's coming up for me to kind of make sense of that concept, I suppose, is that that person is acting out of self-love or love of attempting to maintain power over another, maintain their identification with their own trauma 
maintain, right? Is that is that where you would go with love? Because other than that, I'm having a really hard time understanding how that would translate up into that. It's all of that. And I'll, I'll be honest and name that as a mother, it is really hard for us to go back to that example. And I think I understand that you're doing it because that is like the most like difficult to wrap your head around Mm -hmm. atrocity. And what I learned from that woman I was telling you about was what she came to do in her investigation of the person who under, who um, did that horrific thing to her in her childhood was really understanding who he was and what he was was someone who socially really struggled to be in connection with other adults and really uh, struggled to experience love in any way. And the way that he felt safest to do it was through a child. Now, one thing that Neil Donald Walsh says that's really important, and please hear this point because I think this is the point that we don't hear. Understanding it is not the same thing as condoning it. Yeah. And that's where everybody sort of like misses that part. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's saying what is happening is okay. It's okay. In any of these atrocities. But if I can understand how someone got there, because I don't actually believe that any baby is born um, able to do Evil. horrific things. Yeah. But I think all kinds of pain points, all kinds of life events um, bring people to a space where what they are attempting to do, which is receive love, shows up in really distorted ways. You know, it's that thing of people who often need love the most, ask for it in the most unloving of ways. That's Mm. the most extreme example. Um, But I think that we have really, as a society, lost our ability to attempt to understand. And I think that that, you know, I just come back to like these like masculine um, structures that I believe are falling. And I believe that what we are being called to do is come back into our feminine, which is attempt to see things through the space of connection. Like, where do I do that? Like, it's so easy for our ego to say that is evil, that is wrong. But I'll tell you, V, someone did something like that to my child. I don't know that that type of ego evil would not come out of me. I believe it might, right? No. I I mean, I could very clearly see in my mind me putting a bullet between someone's brain. I mean, or between someone's eyes, even with all my spiritual practices. (laughs) Everybody has something they feel that way about, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has something that they feel so strongly that they want to protect in terms of their love for it, that they would act out of, you know, the most unloving, fearful response to something. And it just becomes like a, a domino. And I think there's so many ways societally that we think we can meet rage and anger and darkness with more of the same. Mm-hmm. And that's not how it works, right? You can't get there of clearing out the rage and the anger and the darkness through mar- more darkness. We need light. We need yes. connection. I was just listening to, um, there's this guy on TikTok that I like who he's actually a priest, but he is, um, I shouldn't say, but that that sounds rude. There's actually plenty of them out there, but he is a priest who is also, um, how do I put this? (laughs) I'm very conscious of my words. Mm -hmm. Speaks about the Bible and the teachings of Jesus in a way that is accurate to the teachings that Jesus actually tried to bring to people. I don't know how else to say this. Um, he was t- Christ like in his teachings about Jesus. Fascinating. Fascinating. <laughs> the teachings that we do in our life actually being like the teachings that Jesus actually mm-hmm. brought to us. And the specific scripture that he was talking about was the eye for an eye. And he was talking mm-hmm. about how this in this one I'm going to say scripture. I don't, I, I'm very uneducated when it comes to the different terms and terminology and how we call these things like a uh, Psalm scripture works scripture. I don't, I don't know. Scripture works, uh, yeah. He was saying that how out of this, we actually, uh, many of our current idiot idiotisms, that's the word, right? Idiotisms have come from this. So eye for an eye going the extra mile. Like he actually listed mm-hmm. a few of them out, which is interesting. Um, but anyway, he was saying a lot of people stop at an eye for an eye. That's where they stop. Right. And he like goes through the entire scripture. And he says that the way that Jesus actually says it is it was very Makes common. The whole world blind. It is very common in um, especially when when Jesus was alive, right? In the Roman times. Um, the reason why an eye for an eye was actually part of even the law uh, yeah. was so that 
this kind of revenge, this blood revenge didn't get air quotes out of control. So they essentially established this idea of an eye for an eye. So that's, they said, if somebody blinds you, you're allowed to blind them back, but that's it. You can't go any further, right? Um, you know, if somebody strikes you, you're allowed to strike them back and that's it. You're allowed to go no further. He goes through all the examples of that. And he said there was a purpose for that back, back then. That was what they put in this. So Jesus goes through all of that, you know, an eye for an eye, da, 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 da. he lists all these examples that are actually in the law. And he says, Basically, that's when he goes into the um, kind of but, <laughs> his but, which is my suggestion to you is, or I think how you should be living is you turn the other cheek. Somebody slaps you, you turn another cheek. And so he actually turns it into a teaching on why he doesn't believe an eye for an eye, you know, is how we actually should be living, how we should say if somebody strikes you, you just turn the other cheek and you give them the other cheek. Um, that you should actually be acting from a place of love and not a place of retaliation. And I just thought it was really interesting because, you know, I think again, as somebody who's taken a lot of, I, I grew up with my own understanding of the church and Christianity, but who's taken a lot of these spiritual teachings from people who I believe do do them at like very face value without really getting into the nuance of what the Christ teaching was and is. Um, and I think that gets used a lot today in politics too. Like we just use mm -hmm. a soundbite. And then base an entire structure of belief on it without actually really boiling it down to what the meaning of it was. Um, I just found what he said really interesting because it's it just reminds me of what you're talking about, I suppose, with this book. Yeah. And I think that if we can always meet with curiosity, what about and listen, I'm certainly guilty of like hearing a soundbite and being like about mm -hmm. someone and and that's really easy to do, but can I be curious about understanding how that person got to that perspective or what else did they say? I've heard about an eye for an eye that it sort of continues to makes the whole world blind. You know, I remember when Osama bin Laden was killed and everyone was like cheering in the streets. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there's just something about the fact that we're celebrating any human's death, no matter what they've done with like a celebration that like feels a little, what does that say about us as people? Um, and where does it end, right? Like at what point do we take the lives of the people that are responsible for taking that life and who decides, right? It just feels, I don't know, if we believe <clears throat> that there is a greater intelligence to all of this. And, you know, I often come back to something that you shared with me when you were reading Alan Watts once, and you were saying that so much of what we understand about death is what we are taught about death, that death is a horrific thing, but death is no more horrific than birth. Um, they're two sides of the same coin. And in this book I was telling you about, I, I just want to share this because I thought it was so beautiful. Um, basically what Neil Donald Walsh was saying was that God understands her children as all being out in a little like safe backyard, basically with like a fence around it where nothing can harm them. And they will basically be out there playing out their little like ego fights and their little like, you know, wars and their little like, you know, things that they think should or shouldn't be happening. They're like children. Uh, we're, we're like God's children out there playing. But eventually God knows that we'll it'll be uh, playtime will be over and we'll come on back in the house. Right. And that's what happens when we die. And God's not worried about us in the backyard because he knows there's nothing that can really harm us here. Mm -hmm. But if we believe that death isn't the end, then we don't have to be so desperately fighting against something that ultimately is love. You know, every person I've ever heard talk about a near-death experience says, oh, there was nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Beauty, so beauty, light, warmth. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're so held in like a homecoming of the most beautiful energy possible. But we defend against it because we don't know. We haven't felt that. We can't remember, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think so often we're talking about atrocities surrounding death when it's like, is it an atrocity? Yeah. I guess to go back to the kind of struggle that people are expressing around the trauma, kind of identify or identifying with your trauma or kind of defining you. Um, my question or my suggestion would be, well, one, maybe if it's not too triggering or activating for you, or maybe even if it is, maybe do it with your therapist. If it is, try that practice that I was mentioning that that guy Flynn Skidmore was talking about on his, his page around, you know, imagining what you might be like or what your relationships might be like if suddenly somebody waved a wand and that wasn't the reality of your life or your mm -hmm. existence, you know, or, or something that happened to you. Also, I want to reiterate a point that you made 
as a, another takeaway, which is just because we and many other people, but just because we are saying that your trauma should not define you um, or that you should actually, I'm not going to use the word should again, it's a different journey for everybody um, that some people are, are able to get to a place where maybe they are able to see it through love um, or, or integrate it in a different you know way, kind of like this woman you were talking about. No one is condoning it. And I think we have to be really clear about that. We can look at things through the eyes of love. We can look at things through the eyes of, I will not let this define me. And that does not mean that anyone is condoning or saying behavior is right. And I think for a lot of people, that one nuance, I don't even know if that's a nuance or if that's actually very black and white, is something that keeps people from then not identifying with, right? It actually keeps people from allowing themselves to kind of drop the sword um, and and move forward into the rest of their lives uh, with a different level of kind of grace and understanding of self and integration and all these words that you and I reference a lot. And so I just wanted to kind of reiterate that point. And then I guess to kind of, you know, I've got a few more minutes on this, but I, I wanted to speak to the second part of what people are really pushing back on in this video, which was Danielle was talking about how the change that social media has brought to the therapy landscape and how, you know, we, we have therapists kind of at our fingertips now and that's new. And, um, the words that she used were as a society, we've kind of become addicted to therapy, you know, in her words. And a lot of people, again, like that's bullshit. Therapy is amazing. Therapy's changed my life. And like, I mean, my consistent messaging back to people when I'm responding is yes and yes and yes and right. Um, no one is saying it's not. If if I said that, I wouldn't have a job. Like, of course, clearly, I'm saying I love therapy. I wouldn't do what I do if mm -hmm. I didn't. You know, no one is saying fuck therapy, throw it out the window. Like that's what not what anybody is saying. But I think that people hear things through the ego. They hear things through the righteousness. They hear things through, if I were to hear this and allow it in, then then it challenges some belief I have about myself. And I, and I just want to clarify that what I took away from what Danielle was saying and something that you and I have also talked about, and I know I believe in, is that the whole point, maybe not one point, but one of the points of therapy is to bear witness to Mm -hmm. and allow somebody that um, stage on which to work through and and heal through whatever's going on with their lives and then to move forward into their life with a new understanding, with a new set of tools, with a new whatever. But they don't need therapy forever. That should not ever be the goal of therapy or of a therapist. It's to essentially keep their clients in need of them forever because really all you're doing is transferring your desire and need for a parent over to your desire and need for this therapist to be your parent. Right. Yeah. I just want to talk about that a little bit. I don't think we should ever have a need or a dependency. You know how I feel about this on anything, but I probably will be in therapy for the rest of my life. I love the work of introspection and, um, just like being in the inquiry, obviously like I'm a therapy geek and that doesn't mean I'm dependent upon it. You know, I think what I heard in what, Danielle was saying was there's a way of like, and people can be in therapy for years mm -hmm. and just sort of be in there venting about like what yep. their day or the week has been and why they are a victim of so many things. And that's actually not doing anything to build your resilience or mm -hmm. um, strengthen your belief in who you are and your sense of self. You know, if you're not also, you know, I think she said the words that, like, we're not really willing to like do the work and mm -hmm. Um, get out in nature and accumulate an entire toolkit of things that we use to thrive in our lives. Mm -hmm. And if we believe we need anything outside of ourselves, I do think that that becomes a dependency. And I do think that that is just like sort of transferring one form of disempowerment for another. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you and I have talked about a lot like this. Go I was just talking about this actually in a podcast the other day where I was saying, I don't know if it's a human trait or if it's just been a trait of humans, maybe since we shifted into this more kind of patriarchal landscape where we need this external, right? So whether we need kings and queens mm -hmm. or we need the Kardashians or we need the president, right? Like as people, we're like always 
putting our power outside of ourselves and looking to somebody else to tell us how to do it and how to do it right and looking to somebody else to say, yes, good boy, good girl. Um, here's what you should be angry about. Here's what you should not be angry about. Here's how you should live your life. Right. And, and that outsourcing to me makes sense as more of a patriarchal structure as more of this kind of wounded masculine structure, right. Rather than being kind of, uh, solidly in my own sense of self and not needing somebody outside of myself. It also feels very childlike, right? Mm -hmm. It is very much the place of being in that childlike space where I look to my mom or my dad, but my caregiver to tell me what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, which even that I question by the way, because I think to a certain extent, children have an innate ability to know what's right and wrong. And I think we, um, as a society think that it's more of our job than it actually is to teach our children. That's a whole I other, to teach them anything. whole other <laughs> podcast conversation. I'm like deep into the book, um, hunt, gather parent right now, like as research mm -hmm. for the book I'm writing. And it's so interesting. She talks a lot about this, the like Western way of parenting and, um, how different it is than literally any other place on this planet and how young and tiny it is and how much it makes up almost all of the research. And yet it's like 8% of <laughs> how the world population parents, whatever I digress. We're a young society, but I also think that what you're speaking to, like, it's amazing to me how it all comes back to our fear of death, mm -hmm, right? And mm -hmm. our, our lack of some sort of a spiritual grounding as a society. And that we believe we put our faith in these structures and these governments and these external entities. And that comes back from the origination of the human need to know, like, where do I come from mm -hmm. and what happens when I die? And so if religious structures said many years ago from that patriarchal stance, there is a father that you answer to outside mm -hmm. of yourself. And if you fall out of line, that father will punish you. And that Punitive. father is God, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a way to do life right. And that is actually what I'm coming to understand, not what the point from my perspective um, of what we're doing here is at all. We are just as much a part of that intelligence that created us. And we came here to create our lives and to determine from ourselves, from our own inner authority, um, what is truth? What is a good life look like for me? And um, what meaning can I make of the experiences that I've gone through? Because I think a lot of times the resistance to the the willingness to make meaning or transmute some of these really difficult moments in our lives is that it shouldn't have happened. Mm. It shouldn't have happened to me. I shouldn't have gone through trauma. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this. It sort of becomes okay, but then who should? And mm -hmm. who said that you were promised a life that was just going to be easy, free of no suffering. difficulty and no pain. Nobody told you you came here for a life that you were guaranteed you wouldn't experience pain. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like one of those, like, to your point, like hard adult <laughs> moments, but the inner child in us wants to say, but it shouldn't be painful. I shouldn't have to do hard things. Um, and our inner adult has to say, no, life will have moments that challenge me in order for me to grow. Through. That's, that's why we came. I wonder if that's a, if that's a Western like just because I'm thinking about this book that I'm listening to right now or reading right now, I wonder if that is more of a Western way of looking at it. Like I shouldn't have to suffer, you know, um, think it is. there's this promise that life should be, uh, you know, as long as I work hard enough and I check those boxes, um, and I do the right things that life should be easy and I should be promised all of these things. And that does ring, ring to me a little bit like our kind of Western way of looking at things. Right. Um, yeah, well, so whether you were the person who reposted the Danielle clip or whether you were somebody who struggled with it, I just hope this conversation was helpful. Um, obviously Danae and I regularly just invite you in on our journey as we kind of meander around, circumnavigate, circumambulate all the words, <laughs> the topics that we do in hopes that they kind of shed light on things for you the way that they do for us. Because I know for us, this has always been kind of like one of the cruxes of our friendships is just like taking a topic and turning it over and, 
and then learning through that conversation. So I just wanted to talk about this a little bit more. 